pixelated maelstrom forms in the dark. Abstract shapes slowly emerge. A heavy drone plays in the background. I can use the controller to add notes to the ominous soundtrack. This is the first scene of Lifespan, one of the very first art games. It was designed by John O'Neill in 1983 for the Atari 800. I was aware of some games from the early 80s made with a clear expressive intent. Moondust, sometimes regarded as the first art game, was made the same year by Jaron Lanier, who later became a key figure in virtual reality and a critical voice in techno culture. And one year before, uh, Lanier programmed Alien Garden, also for Atari, with Bernie DeCoven, co-founder of the New Games movement. And then there was Mike Builds a Shelter, a 1983 arcade game by artist Mike Smith. And Deus Ex Machina by Mel Croucher. These are all obscure titles, but they are now canon in the history of art video games. However, I never heard of Lifespan before, despite the fact that it got some decent coverage at the time, and it was presented by the publisher as the first video game as a work of art. The author, John O'Neill, was even saluted by the press as the Dali of computer gaming. I couldn't even find a complete Let's Play video of Lifespan, so I made this one. And I got in touch with John to get some details straight. Hello? Hi John, this is Paolo, thank you for your time. First, uh, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm John O'Neill. Um, I'm, like you Paolo, I'm an artist, game designer, and um, I know, explorer of possibilities, I would say, really. Lifespan is a series of game vignettes. Uh, they represent different stages of human life, from childhood to death. The prenatal vortex gently transitions toward the childhood level. You are in a playpen, your character spells life, and you can move uh, some toy blocks around. According to the author, the abstract shapes bouncing around are aspects of characters, and you have to trap them using the blocks. You're developing your personality. It's a compelling mechanic that I haven't seen in other games of the Atari age. John O'Neill is an Englishman with a background in painting and printmaking. At a young age, he grew disillusioned by the elitism and uh, inaccessibility of the art world. I got my first one-man show in London at the age of 23. And that was a big turning point, because what happened then is I found out that people were buying work for investment, and not particularly because of what the piece of work was about. So that really upset me a bit. And that combined with the fact that I'm totally an idealist, put me on the path which then started me um, looking at, at games um, as a vehicle, um, as an art form really. And it's been, it's been a long, lonely journey. So he came up with his own philosophy that involved bringing art to the masses. He started to produce postcards as part of the male art movement and uh, a deck of playing cards that combined symbolic imagery from different traditions of playing cards. The second scene of lifespan is titled Opportunities. You zoom through deep space waiting for a signal in the interface. The best opportunities are the ones that match your character features from the childhood level. When the opportunity manifests itself, you have to slow down until you stop. An eerie sequence follows. For John O'Neill, a major opportunity came in 1980, when he was in the United States lecturing about interactive arts. His talk uh, piqued the interest of researcher at the Xerox Park and Stanford, he eventually met an Atari producer who convinced him that computer games were the perfect medium for his philosophical ideas. After entering the Opportunity Portal, you are taken to the next scene, titled Situations and Conversations. This one is a bit hard to parse. You are uh, in a kind of city grid. The goal is to become interesting to the inhabitants of this place by touching the color blocks representing common interests. When you're interesting, your character looks glitchy, it's a glittering, and you 
can be accepted into a conversation. I will never have guessed how it works without the information found uh, in some old interviews, but I'm impressed by this attempt at representing um, social capital in a playable and systemic way. O'Neill moved to Silicon Valley and started to work for Atari. He made the graphics for ET Phone Home, which is not the infamous ET the extraterrestrial for the Atari 2600, often referred as the worst game ever. No, it was a game for the 8 bit Atari family, uh, a home computer family, and it was much better and uh, it had really cute graphics. I got appendicitis when I first got here, too. So I stayed with Stuart Rosen and his wife, so I couldn't walk for about a week. And during that time, he said, he said, um, if I bring you a computer and show you how to use it as an animation tool, do you think you could build me some pictures of E.T.? So I said, OK, I'll try. So we, that evening he came back and he showed me with it. And the next day evening he came back and I'd done three pictures of E.T. And the next day he came back and he said, Spielberg really likes these. You're the graphics person on the computer game of E.T. <laughs> I did that for a, for a few months, but and it's a lot, awful lot of money. It was ridiculous. <laughs> To O'Neill, uh, the younger game industry appears full of potential for artists, musicians, and playwrights. But still, there was a lot of work to be done. In a 1984 interview, he claimed, quote, Most of the games so far have been done by computer people. There's nothing wrong with programmers writing games, but printers aren't the ones who write books, end quote. The fourth scene in Lifespan is titled The Experience Corridor. You have to avoid objects representing worries, fears and doubts while trying to hit the white bits that are representing hope. I like how your character gets partially erased by the impact, but overall this scene is brutally hard and the metaphor is somewhat contrived. O'Neill claimed, in my games I try to put as many cliché as possible so one can begin to see the cliché in one's life. By the way, this allegorical use of game tropes and mechanics is also found in more recent art slash art house indie games like Jason Royer Passage, uh, which is also about a lifespan, uh, or Rod Humble's Marriage, which abstracts relationships or Dysphoria by Anthropy, which employs different mini-games to describe different situations and uh, emotional states. Eventually, O'Neill founded his own company with Stuart Rosen, another Atari employee, and started working on Lifespan and a couple of other experimental games. But it wasn't a great moment for the video game industry. O'Neill's first publisher went bankrupt during the great video game crash of 1983. Seems like just as they were getting going, they went bankrupt. As I understand it, I was told later that the first 5,000 units were put in a landfill. Oh, in that landfill, the famous landfill? I know. It's kind of sad, really, isn't it? It's awful for me. Another company picked up the title and uh, published a small edition. Lifespan got very favorable coverage from the gaming press, possibly better than many contemporary art games. O'Neill released another experimental game in 1985 called The Dolphin's Rune, or The Dolphin's Pearl, a poetic odyssey. It was for Commodore 64. The game is meant to explore interspecies communication. You're a dolphin and you have to assemble an ancient poem in Dolphinese. The game attempts to represent a three-dimensional space with 2D graphics. The view is from the side, you can swim in eight directions, plus you can move back and forth along the axis orthogonal to the screen plane. The ocean gets darker as you dive down. You have to resurface every six minutes to breathe, or you can die. In shallow waters you're likely to encounter tuna nets that trap you. You can also get bitten by sharks, they are rare but quite hard to avoid. The first goal is to find a color current. You see some colored areas, uh, you want to swim toward the center until it fills the whole screen and you get sucked in. In the current you have to stay in the center following a phantom dolphin. If you stay in the current for long enough, you experience uh, a magical sequence. To quote from the manual, 
a mystical dolphin inside, a dream vision that will provide some clues about the meaning of life and about dolphin lore. John Lilly, who was known for his research into dolphin language, sensory deprivation tanks and LSD, was a consultant for this project. And by the way, the more well-known uh, Echo the Dolphin by Sega was also inspired by Lily's research. Once you're back to reality, you hear a phrase of clicks and whistles, uh, and you have to recognize the color current uh, associated to the phrase. You enter the current, uh, and uh, you have to exit from it when the pulse becomes almost continuous. Getting out from the lower part of the screen takes you to a brightly colored seabed. If you follow another sound clue, you can find a stanza of the poem. At this point the dolphin goes in a suspended state, uh, and now you have to decipher a poem using the Dolphinese uh, to English uh, dictionary in the printed manual. You have to put verses in the correct order, knowing that some of them are really in the right place. Supposedly then you have to do it again for several stanzas, and possibly even identify a false stanza. I didn't manage to decode the poem, some runes uh, are ambiguous and one symbol is not even present in the manual. But if you managed to beat the game in the 80s, you could have sent the solution to an address in Illinois and win a trip to Hawaii. Maybe it's a challenge for the internet hive mind. Back to lifespan, the final sequence is a generative abstract display based on your game performance. It's the electronic equivalent of a life flashing before your eyes as you die. All the scenes are accessible non-linearly, which is great because it's easy to get stuck, except for this last one, which will start automatically if you just don't interact with the title screen. O'Neill wanted this part of the game to be accessible without the challenge so that, quote, people could put it in a television screen and have a beautiful computer art display in the living room. The video game crash of 1983 had long-lasting effects in North America. Many publishers uh, went off business and uh, John O'Neill's new projects were cancelled. After Dolphin's Rune, he worked on a game project by Timothy Leary, the prophet of LSD again, and uh, an environmentalist project called Gaia that was unfortunately for CDI, uh, which is a format that lost the competition against the CD-ROM. Today, John O'Neill is based in Nevada City, California. He teaches painting, and uh, he went back to non-digital games in the early 2000s and started a company called GameWise. His board games are still artful and trippy and uh, dealing with issues like global warming and uh, surviving under capitalism and profound philosophical issues. He's focusing on games that can deepen the understanding of the other players. I've been developing physical art games. I found that switching back to a physical game, there's a lot happens between people around the table. In the game title More, you play as the visionaries of two tribes trapped in the cycle of war over territory. It has a contemplation guide to encourage meta-reflection. John O'Neill might not get the prize for the creator of the first art video game by just one year, but I like to think of him as the first video game artist in the contemporary sense. He didn't just make fine art using video games as raw material, like many modders or game artists starting from the late 90s. He entirely and earnestly embraced the video game form, even if it meant dealing with a troubled industry, being an oddball in a world of engineers. And John's body of work is still developing today, after over 30 years. <laughs>